Hey, have you ever wondered why most cans look like this or this or this, but never like any of these? Nowadays, our global canned food consumption is more than 200 billion cans a year, which is about 6,000 cans per second. That big of a number can be hard for us to visualize, so let's go over this little animation in order to see how big 200 billion really is. Now, you can't even see how small a single can at the beginning is, right? So let's zoom back in a little bit. I think it's pretty clear now that that's a lot of can consumption. So the can makers need to be able to keep up with the speed and they want to be as efficient as possible because the cheaper and faster they can make the can, the more money they make. For now, let's say that the cost to produce the can only depends on its surface area, which is the amount of stuff that you used to make the can, right? This is far from real, but hey, stick with me for a bit here. So if that's the case, we can just go with whatever shape with the smallest surface area to minimize the cost and call it a day. Right? It's not that easy. If you go with some weird shape, you could upset the customer by making cans that are flimsy or hard to use. And also, the shape of the can decides what manufacturing process you can use, which impacts how fast you can make the cans. First, let's take a look at the sphere, which is the shape with the least possible surface area for a given volume. However, some of their downside are they are easy to just roll off the table, they are hard to drink or eat from, and they are also hard to manufacture properly. What about the cube boy then? The best thing about them is that they are really good at stacking on top of each other with zero space in between, so you can pack and ship them really efficiently. However, they having corners is one of their biggest downside. Because the corners can make the can awkward to handle, and also the corners are the weak point that could let the stuff inside leak out. We could go on and on and talk about more shapes, but I think you get the idea. So let's go back to the usual cylinder shape cans. When you look at it, a cylinder is like a 50 50 mix between a sphere and a cuboid. See? It looks like a circle from the top and a rectangle from the front. But more than that, cylinders combine good things from sphere and cuboid because they are easier to stack and pack than the sphere while also have a smaller surface area than the cuboid. They are also easy to handle and easy to manufacture. Look, just put together two circles and one rectangle like this. For all these good reasons and more, most cans were made cylindrical. And now that we have settled on the shape of the can, we can go back to our original question, how to make them as cheaply as possible. And for that, we want to design a cylinder shaped can with the smallest surface area. First, notice that we have two parameters that we can adjust in our design, the radius and the height of the can. Before we continue, let's have a quick refresher on geometry. For a cylinder with radius r and height h, its surface area is equal to 2 times the circle area, 2 pi r square, plus the rectangle area, 2 pi r h, and the volume is equal to its cross-sectional area times height, which is pi r square h. Next, let's see how much cost we can save by choosing the right radius and height for your can. Let's say that we have three can designs, a tall design with its height equal to 4 times its radius, a mid design with its height equal to twice the radius, and a short design with the height equal to radius. Now, 
we want to make a fair comparison between the three designs, right? For that, we set all of the volume to be equal to 300 cm3, which is about the size of the normal beverage can. See that we have two unknowns, the R and the H, and two equations for each of the design. We can go ahead and solve for the unknown for each case, and then use that to calculate the surface area. We can see now that the mid design is the best out of the three, and that it has about 5% less surface area compared to the other two. Now you might think 5% is not a big deal, but at the scale that we are talking about, 5% could be millions of dollars. Or you might ask, can we have an even better design? How about we get the mid design and adjust it a little bit to see what happened? Or what if we decide to make a bigger or smaller can? Can we still reuse the same design or not? In math, we call this kind of problem the optimization problem. To solve an optimization problem is to answer questions like how do I maximize my profit using only limited resources? Or how to minimize the cost given the requirement that I have to meet? For example, you might want to build the biggest possible box from a single piece of cardboard that you have. Or in our case, we want to make a can of a certain volume with the least possible surface area. There are many many ways to solve this kind of problem and we are going to go through two of them in this video. The first approach is through trial and error, which only requires some high school level math to do. Then the second one is through calculus, which will be a little bit more advanced. We will see that both approaches are correct, and there is no single right way to do mathematics. Now, you might get a little bit confused. Like, I don't even know where to start. At times like this, I think there is no correct answer, really. You just have to go for it. What you want to know is the relationship between radius, height, and surface area, right? I think we just go experiment with the various values of R and H, then calculate the surface area, write them down, and then plot everything out. Let's see what we get. Hmm, maybe just me, but I can't really get anything out of this plot at all. Someone else might be able to, or if I continue to plot more data point, then I will eventually see something. But I quickly noticed that 3D plot is kinda hard to work with. Because 1. The 3D plot is actually pretty hard to see. And 2. You can't make a 3D plot with just pen and paper. And I think it would be unreasonable for us to rely on some 3D math software to solve the problem. So unfortunately, our first attempt doesn't work, but it's okay, we will just try again. Actually, there is something that I saw a lot of smart people do when they try to solve something that may be too hard or too complex to solve. They usually go and simplify the problem first. You see, in our previous attempt, we look at every possible values of R and H simultaneously which is like trying to solve the optimization problem for all shape and size of the cans, which is hard. So what if we take one thing out of the picture first? What if we say that we gonna solve the problem only for cans of a specific size? You see, if we fix volume V as a constant and decide on the value of the radius R, we can then solve this equation for height h. We then plug this back into our surface area equation. Now, since we fix v as a constant, right? See that now the surface area only depends on the radius. That sounds nice, I guess. But what does that mean? It means that now we can plot our experiment result with only a two-dimensional plot with a radius on one axis and surface area on the other. And with that, we just get rid of the nasty 3D plot. 
Next is to get back to experimenting. First, we need to decide on the value of V. Here we just choose 300. And then we throw in a bunch of different values of R into the surface area equation. See that we get a nice curve from that. And the curve tells us that the can with a radius equal to 3.63 has the minimum surface area for this case. We then use this to calculate the height. Once we are done, we just repeat the whole experiment with different values of V and write down the result. Looking at the result, can you see any pattern? Feel free to just pause the video if you want to think about it first. Okay, so the pattern is, in every case that we observe so far, the height of the can is always twice the radius. Now, let me introduce the new variable called p from proportion, which is equal to the height over the radius of the can. With that new definition and our observation, we now write down our hypothesis that the cans with p equal to have minimum surface area regardless of the volume. And as for how that we want to prove it, we will plot P against the surface area. If our hypothesis is true, then the curve will always have its lowest point at P equal 2, no matter what the volume is. But to do that, there is something we need to figure out first. In our previous experiment, we plot the radius against the surface area, right? And we did that by first writing the surface area equation in terms of radius. And now that we want to plot P against the surface area, we need to do the same. Write the surface area equation in terms of P. The easiest way to do this is to write radius in terms of P, then plot that back into the surface area equation. You can pause if you want to see the detailed calculation. And now that we have all that we need, we go back to performing a similar experiment but this time with our new surface area equation. We can see that the lowest point of the curve is always at p equal 2, no matter what the can's volume is, exactly as what we have hypothesized. And that's the conclusion. The optimal shape of the can is with its height equal to twice the radius, which will look something like this. We are almost done. The only thing left to do now is to check if your solution is actually correct. Once we have the solution, we want to see if it actually matches with the reality. Because if it doesn't, then the solution is kinda useless, right? So as a sanity check, I went and bought a bunch of canned food I found in a local supermarket. Then I measured their radius and height, and used them to calculate the proportion. We can see that the values varies quite a lot, and most of them are quite far from 2, which is what our solution says they should be. Is that fine? Or that means that our solution is a complete garbage? Not so fast. If you think about it, Actually, it doesn't matter if P is different from 2, because all that we care about is that the real can's surface area should be close to the theoretical minimum values. So we go and calculate the wasted surface area percentage by comparing between the observation and the theoretical minimum values from our calculation. We are going to use our surface area equation from before here. Again, feel free to pause if you want to see the whole calculation. We then plot this waste percentage curve against our data point. We can see that most data points have less than 2.5% waste, but there are two obvious outliers. Can number 1, which is way too short, and can number 11, which is way too tall. In the worst case, can number 11 has almost 10% wasted surface area, which I think is unacceptable. What's happening here? In this kind of situation, when your theory doesn't agree with what you see in practice, you know that something about your theory has to be wrong. 
So let's find out what our mistake was here. Once we take a closer look at the cans themselves and throw away the cans label, we can see that some of the cans have these vertical seams on the side. The seams tell us that these cans were made by putting together two circle sheets with another rectangle sheet. This is called a three-piece can, which matches with our original assumption of how the can were made. We also know that the rest of the cans, which don't have these seams on the side, are two-piece cans, which use a very different manufacturing process. Therefore, all of our calculations are invalid here. If you want to know more about the two-piece can and how they were made, please check out the first link in the description. Let's get back to our plot and then look at only three-piece can. We can see that all of them are very close to the theoretical optimal value. This is very reassuring that our solution is actually correct, but it only applies to the case of three-piece cans. The next time that you see the cans, you should be able to identify three-piece or two-piece cans. And also notice that most of the three-piece cans will look something like this. And that is because they are still close to the optimal shape. Now this is the last part of the video, which is to do it again but with calculus this time. Honestly, this is not the main focus of the video. Because if you already know calculus, then you probably already know what it is about. And if you don't, that's completely fine by the way. But I don't think I can make an explanation that makes sense without making the video way too long. But my point is, both approaches arrive at the same exact conclusion. The solution for the best shape of the can is still to have its height twice the radius. Two completely different approaches can be both correct. And that, I think, is the best part of mathematics. So, you might ask, what is the point of learning more math then? Why would you want to use the calculus even when you can just use the high school stuff to do the same thing? The thing is, you might have noticed that the calculus part is very short. That's not me being lazy or anything because that's actually all you need to do if you use calculus. Just a few lines of calculation. Compared to all the work that you need to do if you went for the trial and error approach, it's clear that using calculus is way faster. Again, that doesn't make calculus any more correct or superior in any way. But you got to put in less work, and that's nice, right? And not just that, there will always be some kind of problem where using some other math is more efficient than using calculus. So knowing more math is like having more tools in your toolbox so you get to choose what is best suited for the situation at hand. Or you don't even have to do that if you don't want to. You can just do whatever you want, because you already have all the tools in your hand. Now I can't speak for everyone, but to me, that kind of freedom is, is great, it's awesome, 